know. We don't know if we have or not. But we're trying. We assume somebody from the college was put up a number. Right, hello, version. hello. Have your attention, please. Uh, welcome to uh, the first uh, speaker in this semester's uh, Humanity Center Speaker Series. Uh, I'm Professor David Zacker. I am of the Humanities Department. I am also the co-chair of the uh, ECC Humanity Center and the chair of the speaker series. Uh, I'd like to invite you to some other Humanity Center events. We have a number of things that we do during the year. We have a Socrates Cafe, which is an open discussion forum, a very free forum. For those of you who have been there, you know what it's like. It's uh, 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 very entertaining. Um, we have a film series, international film series, the first two Fridays of each month. We show a, an international film uh, in uh, H Building. And then we also have two more speakers this semester. We have Broughton Coburn, who will be speaking on October 15th uh, in the Spartan Auditorium from 11 to 12.15. He will be talking about his latest book uh, about the first American ascent of Mount Everest. Uh, he has spoken here before. Some of you may have seen him. Uh, he's, quite, he's very entertaining. Uh, then there's Ken Baskin, who is a ceramic sculptor uh, who will bring in uh, some of his work talking about it and a, an exhibition will go on uh, and, uh, connected to that. If you want any more information about any of the events that the Humanity Center offers, you can go to uh, www.ecchumanities.org. Uh, we also have some brochures over here on the, if you want to grab one on the way out. I'm not sure how many are left. Uh, I didn't have a, a, a big load. Um, well, I'd like to thank you all for being here. Uh, it is a nice packed room, which is always good to see. Uh, and um, we, this, this uh, speaker was requested by the Peace and Justice student group. Uh, they initiated the process of bringing him in. And I'd like to thank uh, other groups that have uh, helped us with this, uh, including Student Life, uh, MAGIC, the Multicultural and Global Initiatives Committee, uh, and of course the Humanity Center. Uh, and I'd also uh, like to thank Dr. Sam and the ECC Board for supporting our shared values. Uh, our shared values include the freedom of inquiry. We believe a learning community is most engaging and viable when a spirit of free inquiry exists, allowing everyone the freedom to explore new and diverse ideas and to express their interests and attitudes. To this end, the ECC Humanities Center encourages and fosters an understanding of the central importance of the humanities in all areas of academic and creative inquiry within a framework of diversity, global and international perspectives. In particular, the speaker series brings, in, brings speakers of international, national and or regional importance to ECC for the benefit of the ECC academic community uh, to speak on a variety of topics significant to the humanities. Uh, our speaker today fits nicely into those goals. Today, the speaker will be introduced by Dr. Bill Pels. Uh, and after the introduction, uh, Dr. Ayers will speak on the topic of education. Uh, then we'll have a Q&A session following, focusing on today's topic, directed towards Mr. Ayers, Dr. Ayers. It will be moderated by Bill Pels. Uh, we kindly ask the audience to please hold any comments or questions until the Q&A session. And we'll start off with students asking questions since they have asked Dr. Ayers to be here. Uh, and then we'll open the floor to the greater ECC community. So at this time I'd like to present Dr. Uh, Bill Pels. Thank you, David. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. William, or Bill if I may call you that, Ayers, who is a retired distinguished professor of education, a senior university scholar at the University of Illinois at Chicago. <coughs> he was a member of the executive committee of the faculty senate, and also a founder of both the Small Schools Workshop and the Center for Youth and Society. A graduate of the University of Michigan and Columbia University, Dr. Ayers has written extensively about social justice democracy and education, the cultural context of schooling, and teaching as an essentially intellectual, ethical, and political enterprise. He's written many, many articles, many, many books. His articles have appeared 
the Harvard Educational Review, the New York Times, the Cambridge Journal of Education. Among his various books are Teaching Towards Freedom, Moral Commitment, and Ethical Action in the Classroom, and also to teach the journal, journal of a Journey of a Teacher, which won the Witten Award for Distinguished Work in Biography and Autobiography. Today, we're fortunate here at ECC to have him speak on the topic, topic of democracy and education, teaching for liberation. Join me in welcoming Dr. Ayers. Thank you, thank you. Thank you both, and thank you to the Humanities Center for inviting me to Elgin Community College. I've never been here before. Lovely place you have. Um, and to the Peace and Justice Committee for initiating this. Thank you very much. A um, couple of apologies, and then I'll get started. Um, I'm going to sit down for part of it. I had my knee replaced three weeks ago, so I'm old, and I'm walking around on a broken knee uh, or a wounded knee. And also my hearing aids just started beeping at me, which for those of you who have hearing aids, and most of you don't, that means they're about to run out, so I won't be able to hear the questions anyway, and Bill will have to, no, I'm just kidding, I'll hear them. Um, <laughs> you know, th I know there was, and there often is when I speak these days, and it's really only been since the 2008 election, but there was some controversy about my being here, so I just wanna say one word about that. I told Bill I wrote, I, I wore my Read Banned Books t-shirt uh, for the occasion, uh, all the librarians lit up. Um, yeah, because like librarians, I, I'm pretty much a fundamentalist about reading anything you want and speaking to anyone you want. Um, uh, the group that invited me here or even initiated this conversation in no way endorsed anything I've written or said or everything I've written and said. They wanted to have a conversation. If an American college, a community college or a university is not a place where we can have the free exchange of ideas, then there is no such place. And to my conservative and Tea Party friends in the audience, I would think you would agree with me, fundamentally, that the right to speak and have a conversation is essential and must be protected by having speech. Not just by saying it's a nice abstract idea, but by actually engaging on ideas. So I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad that people who object to my being here are here. And I think they ought to raise pointed questions, which I'll be happy to take. Um, it was mentioned that there'll be, I guess, an effort to have students ask questions first, those who initiated this, which I think is fair. But I want to say very clearly that no question should be pre-screened. I have no fear of any question that anybody's going to ask or any comment that you're going to make. I want to have that free exchange of ideas too. So please, engage. And I'm tempted to say, Enough said, let's go straight to the Q&A. But I, I feel a responsibility also to say something about democracy and education since that's what we'd agreed we would talk about. I'm gonna start there, but no question is off limits. Nothing about peace and justice, nothing about politics, nothing about my sketchy history 45 years ago. Nothing's off, off limits. I'm happy to engage with you in anything, okay? Ground rules, but I will be sitting now and then because my knee is killing me, okay. Um, how many of you are teachers or plan to be teachers? Hooray! Um, I want to speak to you first and then I want to talk about this question of what you're going into. First of all, those of you who are going to be te or planning to be teachers, hasn't anybody told you that you're not going to be paid well? So what's wrong with you? Didn't, weren't you listening? You could be a clerk in a store and, I mean, and did people tell you you won't be respected? That every, every two-bit politician with an agenda will stand up and say you're lazy and competent, right? So what, what's wrong with you? Why are you still gonna, no, I'm just kidding. I want you to be teachers and it's, it's my, um, my favorite uh, occupation, my favorite calling, followed by librarians and nurses and physical therapists now. Um, <laughs> but, but seriously, I, I wanna encourage you to be teachers but I think everyone knows that in the world of teaching, this is a fraught moment. This is a moment when teachers are under increasing kind of criticism and attack as if they've somehow created the sorry mess that we've gotten ourselves into. And the way the issue is framed is often, and, and framing an issue, as many of you know, is critical to how you have a discussion. So every time a politician gets to a podium and says, we need to get the lazy, incompetent teachers out of the classroom, 
I feel myself nodding dully. What am I going to say? No, no, keep the lazy ones there for my granddaughter. No, I agree. But if I get to the podium first and say every kid in an American public school deserves an intellectually curious, morally committed, courageous, hardworking, well-rested and well-paid teacher in the classroom, I win that argument. So the question is, what is the ground we're talking about when we talk about teaching? And frankly, I think that ground has been misrepresented and misunderstood for a long, long time. And it's up to us, those of us who are teachers and believe in teaching, to develop a vocabulary for what it is we do that's richer and deeper and more nuanced and more complex than the kind of narrative that's out there. Now, I've been, I started teaching in 1965, and from that day until this, my partner has been a lawyer. So I often find myself over those years at lawyer parties, and this is kind of the scene that would happen over the last 45 years. I'd be at a lawyer party, and some, we'd be having wine and cheese, and some lawyer would come up to me and say, what do you do? And depending on the year, I'd say, I teach kindergarten, or I teach in the juvenile detention center, and the lawyer would al always give me this kind of pitying, patronizing look, as he would say, oh, really, that must be interesting, and then go off to speak to somebody actually interesting, because what could be interesting about a guy who said, I teach kindergarten? So I got tired of that after a while, and I, I developed a snap, what I thought was a snappy comeback. And then the, the, the dialogue would go like this. The lawyer would say, what do you do? And I'd say, I teach kindergarten. It's the most intellectually demanding thing I've ever done. And I recommend that, because it always causes the lawyer's head to snap as he tries to figure out kindergarten, intellectual, I don't get it, what's he talking about? And, and then he would say, it would be a longer pause and a deeper patronizing look, and the lawyer would say, that must be very, very interesting, and then go talk to somebody. <laughs> so I developed an even better response, I thought, and, and then it would go like this, five or six years into this, this uh, comic routine, the lawyer would say, what do you do? And I'd say, I teach kindergarten. It's the most intellectually demanding thing I've ever done. And if you ever want to do something useful with your life and stop making six figures, and then I'd run out of breath. But, but, but I w I wasn't, I'm not just kidding. I think it's important to note that to be a teacher is to take on an incredible intellectual and ethical challenge. And that challenge is made worse by the fact, by the kind of conditions we're living in now. Too many kids, too little resources, too few time. This makes teaching an even more demanding, uh, a more excruciating job. And yet, the job really does take thoughtfulness and caringness at its heart. You cannot teach people you can't see or understand. And so for those of you who are going into teaching, I urge you to make a commitment to yourself right now and a commitment to the, to the uh, calling that you're answering and say, in my teaching, in my teaching life, I am going to make a commitment to see every student who comes before me as a three-dimensional creature with a heart, a mind, a spirit, experiences, hopes, dreams, aspirations that somehow have to be taken into account if I'm going to teach this kid well. That's a commitment that you should make. And even though you fall short every day because there are too many kids and too little resources and too, too little time, that's still a commitment to try the next day to live up to. And the rhythm of becoming a great teacher, and incidentally, the whole kind of spirit of what's going on now with kind of people in the classroom for three years, you know, things like Teach for America, and then my wife is a law professor, and a lot of her students are former Teach for America kids. They go for three years. You cannot become a good teacher in three years. That's both the good news and the bad news. It takes years to become a great teacher. My middle son is an urban, uh, teaches in an inner city school in California. He's been teaching for 10 years. And when I was out visiting him recently, at the, as we took a break for lunch, he's a middle school math science teacher. He sees 150 kids in a day. And as we're going to lunch, I said, Malik, you are a great teacher. And he said, don't say that. I'm a guy who shows up every day and tries to do a good job with these kids. I said, but I think, and, and then I realized, that's part of what makes him a great teacher, is he's not saying, I'm some kind of hero teacher. I'm some kind of great teacher. You know, the images of great teachers that are all over the popular culture, like, um, you know, Stand and Deliver, you know, Freedom Writer's Diary, you know these movies, right? My favorite, you can look this up, is a little piece of satire from Mad TV. And you can find it online, uh, find it on YouTube. 
And it's called Nice White Lady. Any of you seen it? Oh, you must. It's brilliant. Go, go directly. Leave here. No. Um, when you're on your computer tonight, type in Nice White Lady on YouTube. The scene opens. It's a three-minute cut from Mad TV. It opens with a camera looming over a city. And the narrator in a deep, stenorious voice says, The American high school, there's nowhere more dangerous. And at that point, the camera comes into the classroom. And you see these black and Latino and, and Asian kids sharpening their knives and cleaning their pistols. And it says, out of control kids, parents who don't give a damn, lazy, incompetent teachers. What could possibly save them? The door creeps open and a young woman about your guy's age, blonde, peeks in and says, hi, I'm Amy Little. I'm here to save you. And the kids all, Rawr, they all growl. And one girl with maximum urban attitude comes up to her and says, what the hell you know about me, bitch? And she goes on and blah, 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 blah. And Amy Little is stricken and recoiling. And then she takes out a pen and says, write that down. And within minutes, everybody's winning Pulitzer Prizes and putting their guns away. And, you know, and that's the kind of image we have of the great teacher, some kind of lone hero who's out there saving lives in a kind of preposterous way. At some point, she goes to um, the teacher's cafeteria and one of the older cynical teacher says, Miss Little, I know you mean well, but you can't save these kids. They're minorities. And she says, I know, sir, but you can't underestimate a nice white lady. And, uh, and at the end of it, the kids are all jitterbugging in the hallway with her, and those, the, over, the, the um, voiceover is saying, so to improve the schools, we don't need better curriculum or better buildings or you know, smaller classrooms. All we need is a few nice white ladies. And that's the message that's so killing. And it's, it's preposterous and silly on the one hand, but it works because it so much speaks to how we talk about teaching. Teaching's not like that. Teaching is complex, everyday work, mind-wrecking, back-breaking. So my son Malik, back to him for a minute. I saw him over the course of a day see about 120 kids. Every kid who came into his classroom, he knew something about that kid. He'd say, Maria, how's your mother since the operation? Jorge, don't forget what we're doing after school today. Don't miss practice, and on and on. He also knew each of them enough to put them at tables working on math problems that he would coach them on. He was phenomenal. So I said to him, Malik, do you think Arnie Duncan, and for those of you who don't know, that's the Secretary of Education in the United States. I said, do you think Arnie Duncan's ever been in a classroom like this? And he said, Pops, I have a theory. I think that when you move from the classroom to administration or the university, whatever you once knew about teaching, you take a pill and it's all erased. And now you don't know anything about teaching. And he said, there's really two kinds of people. There's those who teach, and then there's those who make policy and, and, and write about teaching. And then pregnant pause, and he said, with all due respect, you're in that second group. And I said, <laughs> thanks, man. Um, but it's true. There are those who teach and those who pontificate and politicize teaching. And those of you who teach, I salute you. I think it is a, an unbelievably important profession. Let me pivot just to say a word about why it's so important. One of the things that we know about education is that in any society, any society, the education system is both mirror and window into the society itself. See what I'm saying? If you know something about the society, you can predict what the schools will be like. If you know something about the schools, you can predict what the society will be like. Let me give you a couple simple examples. In apartheid South Africa, where I went to South Africa both under apartheid and after apartheid. In apartheid South Africa, you can be sure that the schools for white kids had 12 to 15 kids per class, state-of-the-art equipment, well-trained teachers, beautiful buildings, and the schools for the, for the African kids had you know, 60 kids in a classroom, in a shack out in a township, with a broken furnace and a broken roof. That reflected perfectly what apartheid was about, right? I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? Or go to a school in, um, in medieval Saudi Arabia or authoritarian um, uh, Romania. Or, I mean, pick your country, pick your era, and you will see schools that reflect that. In fact, you go to a place like, like um, a fascist Italy or, 
or communist uh, Albania. And the schools are very much based on a very similar idea, which is obedience and conformity. That's what they require. Schools in a, in a um, theocracy require you know, uh, reverence for the, for the religion. Free to, schools in any authoritarian uh, regime require obedience and conformity. Schools in a kingdom require fealty to the crown. So what do schools in a democracy do? What's different about schools in a democracy? And let me say parenthetically that educators in communist Italy, I mean, in uh, fascist Italy or communist Albania or medieval Saudi Arabia, all of these places, the educators want their kids to do well, to study the subject matter, to stay away from drugs, to not get pregnant, and, and we want that too, right? So, so we're all in agreement about some of the things. But where we disagree is profound and fundamental. In a democracy, even in an imperfect and aspirational democracy, we want our kids to develop minds of their own, to develop the freedom to create, to, um, to be able to create, to be able to participate, to be able to um, invent. We do not want to create a bunch of automatons who are simply going along because that's what everybody does. We don't want that. We want something different. So, whereas in a school, in an authoritarian regime, would emphasize obedience and conformity, in a democracy we would emphasize uh, initiative, courage, imagination, um, invention, entrepreneurship. This would be education for a free people. And that's because in a democracy, we base education on a profoundly democratic ideal. And that ideal is, um, is a belief in, a, it's a fragile ideal too, but it's a belief in the incalculable value of every human being. Every human being is of incalculable value. And in a democracy, citizens are the sovereign. So we want people who are smart, capable, capable of making judgments from Information. We don't want people who can be led by their noses here and there. That's not what we, what we aspire to. We aspire to something more. And so, so those of you who are going to be teachers, but those of you who are just interested as citizens or as, as residents or as um, policy people, we have to find ways to emphasize that profound notion that every human being is of value and get away from the idea that the point of education is to separate people um, into, you know, to figure out all the ways in which these people go forward and these people go backward. Let me say it in another way. In a democracy, the fullest development of, of everyone depends on the fullest development of each individual. And the fullest development of each is the condition for the full development of all. This is something that we have to fight for. It's not fully realized, but it is an ideal that anyone can understand, and it seems to me, that anyone can, can, can struggle toward. It, it brings one other thought to mind, and that is that in a democracy, e again, even an imperfect democracy, whatever the wisest and most privileged parents have for their children, we as a community should demand for all of our children. Whatever the wisest and most privileged have, we should demand for all of our children. You might remember after the 2008 election when the Obamas were moving to Washington and there was speculation about where would they go to school. I had no doubt. I had no doubt at all. They were going to go to a school like the one they went to in Chicago. They, went, they chose Sidwell Friends. Sidwell Friends School in Washington is an outstanding school. They have a cap of 12 students per class. Right? So, so that's Sidwell Friends. In Chicago, the Obama kids went to the University of Chicago Lab School. That's also where Arnie Duncan went for 12 years. That's also where Mayor Daley's kids went. It's also where Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago now, it's where his kids go. And it's also, when I moved to Chicago, where my kids went. University of Chicago Lab School. What did they find there? They found classes capped at 15. They found a curriculum based in part on asking your own questions and pursuing your own answers. They found um, a teacher core that was respected 
and, um, and honored and well paid and, oh, horror of horrors, unionized. The teachers at the University of Chicago Lab School are unionized, right? And so nothing happens at the University of Chicago Lab School that isn't part of a negotiated contract. Is that, so if it's good enough for the Obamas, why is it not good enough for the kids on the west side of Chicago? Why do we have a cap of 35 in the second grade on the west side of Chicago? That's an offensive, that's an offensive fact in a society that wants to aspire to be a free and democratic society. So those are the kinds of things that I think we need to pull up, look at, and object to. The other thing they find at lab school and at Friends, as I said, is a curriculum based in part on asking questions. And a curriculum of questioning is essential to becoming a free person. Nothing is beyond questioning. Everything is subject to questions. I want to give you two examples, and I'll close with these. One, an historical example that I participated in, and one, an example that I just made up out of my head a couple years ago. I love that one, because I made it up. Um, but let me give you two examples of a curriculum of questioning. One comes from the great civil rights movement in the United States in the 50s and 60s. Um, and it was in 1963 that a group of volunteers for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee came up with a proposal to create freedom schools. And the idea was the civil rights movement, unlike what you're taught, that it was one kind of monolithic thing that everybody understood and agreed with and so on, it wasn't like that at all. It was a constant struggle. But in 1963, when the movement was lacking direction, no one was sure where to go, a group of kids from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was the group that led the Freedom Rides and the lunch counter sit-ins, came up with a proposal for freedom schools. The, and, and what Charlie Cobb, who wrote the original proposal, which was a page and a half mimeograph to his friends, it wasn't a proposal to the MacArthur Foundation or something absurd like that. Um, but, but what Charlie wrote is he said, the black people of Mississippi have been denied many things. Fully trained teachers, forward-looking curriculum, decent facilities. But the fundamental injury is they've been denied the right to think for themselves about the circumstances of their lives and how they might be otherwise. Think about that. What a profound thing Charlie Cobb wrote. People have been denied many things, but the fundamental injury is the right to think for themselves about the circumstances of their lives. How did I get here? And how could they be different? And if you don't think that was kind of a revolutionary idea in Mississippi in 1963, and remember that several of the assassinations in that period were of Freedom School teachers. Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, the three martyrs of Mississippi, were all Freedom School teachers. And if you turn, and you can find this online as well, turn to the 1964 Mississippi Freedom School curriculum, and you'll see a curriculum of 25 pages that is all questions. That's all it is. And the questions begin. Why are you and I in the freedom movement? What do we hope to accomplish? What do we want to gain? What, do we, what are we afraid of losing? And those are questions that don't have easy answers, but they propel you into a life of thought and a life of wondering about your own life and how you could um, make a difference, how you could change things for yourself and for others. So that's, a, a, I think, a profound historical example and one we could explore at greater length. The sillier, more trivial one, uh, which I thought of myself, um, is based on something I read in the New York Times a few years ago. Do you know who uh, Mike Huckabee is? Governor Huckabee? He's, um, he's the governor of uh, Arkansas. He ran for president a couple years ago. And um, he's a commentator on Fox News sometimes. Uh, Mike Huckabee was once a very huge and large man, and then he lost, I think, about 200 pounds, and he became kind of a poster boy against obesity. And to his great credit, he spoke out against childhood obesity uh, all over the country, and it became part of his campaign. He and Michelle Obama were kind of in the same uh, camp on that issue. Um, and, and then I read in the New York Times something odd, which was in Arkansas in that period, um, they decreed that on your report card, when you took home your report card, you would have grades for, you know, English A, Social Studies B, History C, whatever. You'd also have your body mass index listed on your report card. I, I know several of you are, what? 
don't talk about my body mass index, exactly. Um, and it struck me as kind of funny, you know, that you would say, okay, you got an A in English and a B in math, and you're fat. Uh, with, with, you know, without any kind of um, remedy, without anything to do. And so I thought of a kind of a freedom school curriculum for Huckabee's uh, putting the body mass index on the report card. And it was very simple. So I, I, if I were a teacher in Arkansas, I'm sure I would go along with the mandate. But I like to think I'd also engage my students in a set of questions. And the questions would be things like, um, what is the history of including something on a report card or in a curriculum in terms of changing behavior? How's that, you know, how, how is the alcohol awareness curriculum working out? Or, you know, I mean, you can think of a lot of things. Or I might say, who owns the franchise for the snack bar and the lunchroom in the schools in Arkansas? That might be an interesting thing to inquire into. Or what's the state of our playgrounds? What's the, what's the condition of, um, uh, you know, of the athletic facilities? How much exercise the kids get? What are the stores around the school selling in terms of fast food and chips and the rest of it? The point being that you don't just simply have to sit there and kind of accept whatever's given to you. You can always interrogate it. You can always push back. And that is something, it seems to me, that's essential for those of you who are going to be teachers. Whatever else you teach, the message of teaching should be, you have a right to be here, you have a right to interrogate the universe, you don't have to ask anybody permission to ask the next question. Thanks very much. We're going to have lots of time for Q&A, but I think we're starting with students, correct? Right. And I'd only, we're, uh, I'd only ask a few things. Try to make your question clear. Try to make sure you speak up. And if you have a comment or a question, try to make it concise so we can get it, handle as many questions and comments as, as possible. So like I said, we're going to sort of start with students, then start taking questions from just anyone. Uh, any students want to ask a, a question? You, you have to ask the vilifiers. Sorry. I'll answer that. Well, we're no, no, let's wait. Like, other student questions? I'll get one back here. I spent over 20 years in the Catholic school system, both in the city of Chicago and in the suburbs. I left my career just recently making less than half of what a public student a school teacher makes, but that beside the point. My question to you is, you were talking about the equality of this, the classroom and trying to get smaller classrooms and parents that want equality, the equal opportunity. Why can't we pass a voucher system? Well, I mean, that's one of the things that's being discussed and considered, I guess, all over. I'm not a huge fan of vouchers, and the reason is because I think that um, I think we can... We, we don't need them to improve schools. In other words, why can't we, instead of passing a voucher system, why, why can't we mandate that in the city of Chicago, classrooms will have no more than 18 students in them, and then raise the revenue to make sure that happens? You know, the problem of, you know, they always talk these days in Chicago that there's a great revenue problem. But the reality is, I mean, there's a great, you know, budget problem, but the reality is it's a revenue problem. We, we are one of, you know, we are one of, um, seven states in the country that has a flat tax. And, and that means that Penny Pritzker pays the same rate as her maid. Um, and, and that, to me, is outrageous. If we want to share this space, if we want to share the society, then we have to find a way to decide what we as a community think are the important things and then invest in those things. And, the, you know, I know that, again, some of my Tea Party pals are going to say, you know, you're a tax and spend liberal, which is way, way far from the truth. But the truth is that every government in history, mostly all they do is tax and spend. Conservative governments, reactionary governments, socialist governments, they all mainly tax and spend. The only question we have to worry about as citizens is tax whom, how much, and spend on what. For my money, I want to spend on infrastructure, education, health, guarantees of, of, of a decent life. I definitely, now that I'm 69 years old, I definitely want to spend on pensions. Thank you. Um, kidding. Um, but seriously, I mean, you know, without, we need to decide as a community what we want to spend on. If you want to, if you want to cut government, and I do, cut the Pentagon. 
peace and justice people. I mean, you know, that's a trillion dollars right there a year. So, so you know, to me, that's more, that's a debate worth having. But I think it's absurd to pretend that, that the Chicago public schools are an act of God rather than a series of choices that we've made about who we want to spend on and what we want to spend. And to me, shortchanging education is very much a suicidal mission in the long run. Okay. Hi, I'm um, studying computer science. I worked in computer science for over 30 years, and I'm going back to school now to get a degree in education so that I could teach computer science in low-income, <coughs> impoverished areas. And it's the statistics show that the United States is behind other industrial work uh, countries in math and science and technology. And my question is, has there ever been a society or a country that educates its entire population? Is there really a threat to the power, wealthy, elite? Uh, is there a threat to have a, a very high educated society? And is there any country in the world now or ever that has educated all of its people? I mean, what, what is your answer to the first part of your question? Um, does it threaten the elite? You don't think it does, right, to educate everyone? I wonder, is there a threat? I mean, if, if the masses of people whose labor is exploited, if they are educated enough, they'll know that their labor is exploited and they will protest. Yeah. So if you're not aware of your value because you're not educated about your value as a worker, then I would suspect that would be a threat. Yeah, I mean I, I, I would think so too, although I don't I don't have any expertise about it, but I do think you're making a really important point. I would just add to that that um, education doesn't just take place in schools and, and you all know this from your own personal experience. There's a lot of education that goes on in the neighborhood, the community, the church, um, and, and in, in changing times. My best education did not come. I went to a prep school and, and in the Chicago area, and that was not my best education. I'm not sorry I, I got that education. I read great books and learned how to write certain things and so on. But, but the best education I got was when I joined the Civil Rights Movement, and I learned more in a summer than I'd learned in the 18 previous years, you know. So, I mean, there's a lot of places to get an education. And sometimes I think we spend too much time thinking about things like education or democracy or participation in institutional terms instead of in human terms. So, uh, for sure I feel this way about, uh, about the recent elections. Um, people say to me all the time, um, aren't you disappointed in, you know, what's happened with Obama and so on. And, and for me, I, I think we spend way too much time focusing our gaze at the sites of power we have no access to, the White House, Congress, the Pentagon, and far too little time thinking about our own power within the community, the street, the classroom, the neighborhood, the church. That's where human power exists, and we ought to organize ourselves to, have, to build the kind of society we can build with our own hands, not begging power for change, but doing it ourselves. I don't know any instance in history where everyone was educated. I know that in Europe, they do, in parts of Europe, they do a better job than we do in terms of an equality of, of educational opportunity. I think we have light years to go before we can say honestly, everyone has a chance to get a full and decent education. Everyone doesn't need to be the CEO of a company in order to be successful, but everyone should have a right to the arts of democracy, to the arts of citizenship, and that includes good literature, good music, good art, um, uh, access to creating things. And classrooms, therefore, even the classrooms you all land in, should at least partly look like workshops of discovery and surprise. You know, they should look like art studios. They should look like um, uh, performance spaces. And that's how people develop the ability to express themselves, to say who they are, to name the problems that they're facing, and to do something about them. Okay, next question. That one right here? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, wait, uh, wait, one more student. Yeah, yeah, he's too. Yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, okay, my question is, when you said interrogate 
to get what you want, like for schooling and everything. How is it? How is everyone gonna become one to do that? Because not just one person can do it alone. Like I don't see like, for example, in some schools here, they charge and it's public, and aren't isn't that what taxes are for? Yeah. To pay. So yeah. why do they charge you to go into school? So so you're saying they shouldn't charge to go to? Yeah, I mean. I have two granddaughters in the Chicago Public Schools, and you, you probably aren't that interested in Chicago Public Schools, but I'm intensely, intimately interested in them. And this year, the school they go to took a half a million dollar hit in its budget after closing 54 schools. And they not only got rid of the art teacher and the music teacher, which is, to me, uh, an absolute catastrophe for these kids having a decent education. Again, go back to what I said before about what the privileged have. You think, you think Rahm Emanuel or Mayor Daley or Barack Obama or Arne Duncan would send their kids to a school that didn't have art and music? They would not. I guarantee you they would not. And they have the resources so they don't have to. But a lot of us don't have those resources and so we have to take what's there. And it's outrageous that they would take away their art and music teachers which are part of what it means to open up to the fullness of participating in a free society. They're an important part of it. They're not just decoration. And I could argue about that in a minute. But the other thing they took away, and you probably didn't read this, but I read it and was furious, is that my kids have to take their own toilet paper to school. They have to take their own toilet paper to school in the, in the greatest country on earth, the freest, most prosperous. What are you talking about? I want Mayor Emanuel to take his own toilet paper to, to, to work. This is outrageous. And so to me, no, you should... When they start charging you to go to a charter school, to go to a school, no, that's not fair because that means that, you know, this kid has a chance. You know, when I was talking before about privileged and less privileged people, I mean, what that says to kids, and you all, you know, are kids and have been kids and have kids, what it says to kids is we have one policy when it comes to children in this country, and the policy is choose the right parents. If you choose the right parents, God, life is great. You'll have a great time. Go, to, go on vacations in the Caribbean. You'll go to Europe for your junior year. And you'll, be, you know, you'll go to a great school with small classes, no violence, no, no suicide. You'll be fine. But if you choose the wrong parents, I'm sorry. Why did you do that? What were you thinking? You know, and that's the kind of stupidity that we are up against. So, no, I object to having to spend money to go to a public school. Then, it, then let's talk about public schools. There's Winnetka. And then there's Chicago. Winnetka, you know, which incidentally, those of you who worry about public spending, my little brother always calls Winnetka socialism for the rich, you know, because they have great public parks, great public schools, great public safety, great roads. But they also, you also have to be a millionaire to move there. So, um, you know, everything's great once you're a millionaire. Well, that's ridiculous. We are part of the same social fabric. We're, we're one. We're part of the same thing. We have to find ways to, you know, to fight for what we deserve, to fight for what other people deserve, and not just take from me, but say, what would make a decent and balanced society? I want all kids to have an opportunity to read good books, to participate in activities, to be artists and scholars and playwrights. I want all kids to have that opportunity. So why can't we create a system that does that? We can, is the answer. And the fact that we don't, has less to do with um, and social science than it has to do with political choices. We should make better political choices. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think you need a mic, I'm sorry. So we can demand for equal opportunities when it comes to education, but how do we actually manage to receive those opportunities? Well, again, I, I don't think there's any simple answer. What I do think is that smart kids like you, I'm talking to you, um, you know, can find ways to, it's not just a matter of me demanding for myself. You can find ways to link up with one another, to name the obstacles to your own humanity or to your own full development, and then to move in a concerted way against that. Can I give you one quick example? Some of you won't love this example, but I love it. Um, there's a group called the Immigrant, Immigrant Rights Youth League. Why? Right. You know that group? Are you in it? Okay. Igil. And it came out of the university, and you've read about it even if you don't know the group, and you've read about it because these are the Dream Act kids. 
These are the kids who went and sat in at John McCain's office and got arrested. These are the kids who lobbied Washington. These are the kids who showed up at the Democratic Convention in a big caravan and caused all kinds of noise. So who are these kids? I know many of them very well because they were my students. And these are kids who were born um, in Mexico or Central America, came to the United States as babies or infants or toddlers, and find themselves in the weird limbo of not being citizens and yet knowing nothing except Pilsen in Chicago as a place that they've ever lived. So then they become adults and they go to the university and they find themselves restricted. They, have, they all knew growing up there are certain things we can't talk about. There are certain things we have to be slightly worried about. But good kids, smart kids, went to school, followed the path, went to the university. And in the university, they found each other. How did they find each other? They sit around in the dormitory, talking, having coffee together, and they discovered they shared this circumstance, the circumstance of being undocumented, undocumented, but knowing nothing but America. And they began to talk to each other. What should we do about it? What could we do about it? And they began to develop a kind of political presence on campus, and then in Chicago, and then in the country. And if you ever see these kids, go up and give them an award for good citizenship because they wear t-shirts that say undocumented and unafraid. And that's who they are. And they only became, they were always undocumented, they only became unafraid when they found each other. When they found each other, they had a reference. One of the young women, uh, Raina Wences is a marvelous young woman. She was giving a talk the other day that I, w I attended. And she said, we found a language to express ourselves. We found a cause that we could believe in. We found, and we're naive, we're new, but we're figuring out strategy and tactics. And then she said, and I found another word at the university I didn't know, and it was me too. And she paused and said, lesbian. Wow, who knew? You know, and, and that's, what, that's what growing up is partly about. It's about naming yourself, finding allies, finding a way to participate fully, and you can do it. Yes, you can. Be unafraid. Uh, gentleman in the orange, well, wait for the microphone, please, yes, so I can hear you. My name is Robert Hassey, no, class of 1955. Just a second, just a second. Yeah. Class of 1955 here at ECC. Uh, Mr. Harris won't remember, but from 1968 to 1978, I was a campus recruiter at the University of Michigan for a large national corporation. Hooray, which one? Uh, Aetna Life and Casualty. Okay. And I was physically threatened several times by members of the Weather Underground at uh, the University of Michigan. Matter of fact, make, made it almost impossible to recruit there. Uh, but anyway, that is not my question. My question is, does the name Brian McDonald ring a bell with you, Mr. Ayers? No, it doesn't, but let me say one thing. We overlapped at the University of Michigan. I was there from 63 to 69, but the Weather Underground didn't exist until 1970, and then we were all gone for the next five years. But uh, So maybe it was, I don't know who was threatening well, you, they but all I apologize the same. in any case. They all look the same, then all tie-dye. They, they all look the same? <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Okay. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I can... I'm guilty of looking like some of those other guys. <laughs> But anyway, uh, the question, answer to the question about Mr. Brian McDonald, Sergeant, Police, uh, San Francisco oh, Police God. Sergeant, who died in a hail of shrapnel, set off by the Weather Underground in 1970. That small bomb included many pieces of shrapnel, even live ammunition. And I just wondered if you had a comment on that. Oh, it's a terrible tragedy, but uh, the Weather Underground not only never claimed credit for it, but was never charged with it. So I've seen this around the internet, and I know there. You well, know, I've also heard. I've also bunch. heard. I've also heard that um, that I once said that 30 million people would have to be killed in order to bring about the paradise. None of this is true, but I know that it has a life of its own on the internet, and I know that several people find it endlessly fascinating. But not not a shred of it is true. You deny completely? Deny it completely, absolutely. Having, having set bombs anywhere? Can we, can we move on to another, another question here? Uh, woman in the green. Here you go. I hope she's there. I am a student here. I may not look like it, but I am. You, you do look like it. Are you kidding? <laughs> Let's not be stereotyped. Uh, 
<laughs> so if we could um, fund the elementary and high schools in Illinois via the income tax instead of by the property tax, and if we could change to a graduated rate income tax, and if we could enact a financial transaction tax so that we had more revenue in the state budget, then we could fund every school in Illinois, every public school in Illinois, equally. Would that help? Guys, I love you. Um, student, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think I don't know. I don't know exactly. I, I haven't thought through. You've thought it through further than I have about what kind of taxation would be necessary. But here's what I do know: it would help enormously if we could fund schools. Uh, if we could fund schools to the to the um, extent that they need funding, and I just have one little simple way of looking at it. Um, which is I look at what the privilege to have and I say, why can't we all have that? It's a very simple way and it's even a little simple-minded. But then again, it, it sometimes comes to me, I, I wanna say a word to the librarians. Um, I'm guessing you're librarians, but I don't know if you are. But, but um, you know, in the Chicago Public Schools, I wanna say two things about what the privilege get and what the rest of us get. Chicago Public Schools last spring banned a book called Persepolis. You know that book? Read banned books. You know what? On the back of this shirt, the banned books are listed, and they're things like Where the Wild Things Are, a uh, really terrifying book by Maurice Sendai. Um, but, but Persepolis was banned by the superintendent of the Chicago Public Schools because a parent at Lane Tech objected to the book. It's a graphic novel. I've written my own graphic novel, which I'm going to give to one of you. This is a book about teaching in the form of a comic book. Um, so I'm a big fiend about graphic novels. Persepolis is a brilliant book written by an Iranian girl. It's a coming of age story um, about coming of age during the Iranian revolution of 20, 25 years ago. And it's a, a marvelously thoughtful uh, book by a young woman, comic book. But there is one frame where a, man, a, a boy is peeing in the street and you can see his penis, just like in Where the Wild Things Are. And so this parent called and objected and the superintendent banned the books. So what I do, always when stupid things like this happen, is I called the lab school. And I got a hold of the library and I said, do you have Persepolis in your library? Oh yeah, we have eight copies, two in French. And we also have the movie. Oh, really? And do the kids actually read it? Did they check it out? Oh, it's required reading in the seventh grade. Okay, so Rahm Emanuel's kids get real art and real literature and the kids at Lane Tech get drill and kill. That's where we are headed with the kind of educational system we have. Let me give you one other quick example because it's, it's kind of on, the same, on a similar point. You may know that after the teacher strike last year in Chicago, that there was an agreement made about teacher evaluation, which I think is a very sketchy question and very much, an, um, uh, I won't get into it. I think it's a very complex and sketchy question, teacher evaluation. And the state of Illinois requires teachers in the Chicago public schools, 30% of their evaluation is based on student test scores. Now, if you can't make that link, you're not alone because that link is non-existent. But that's okay. The, the wise people in our state legislature have agreed that 30% of a teacher's evaluation in Chicago will be based on how their student test scores do. Um, shaky. So I went to the lab school, which is what I do. And I asked the principal and the head of the union how they evaluate teachers. We spent an hour talking about what they do in Rahm Emanuel's kids' school. And what did they do? They have it in the contract how teachers are going to be evaluated. And the way they do it is they spent an entire year asking the question within the larger community, what is good teaching? They had parent meetings about it, outside speakers, they read about it, talked about it, grade level groups about it. And they came up with six indicators of good teaching around planning, around assessment, around reflection, around a lot of things. And then they evaluate teachers in year one, two, three, and six based on this rubric that they've developed themselves, agreed about in a union contract, and they never evaluate them again. And I looked at them dumbfounded and I said, well, what role does um, student test scores play in 
the evaluation of teachers. And they said to me, what do student test scores have to do with good teaching? Oh, okay, Rahm Emanuel's kids, hello. But everybody else's kids, 30%. It skewers curriculum, it's wasteful, it's stupid, and it weeds out great teachers and allows in not so great teachers. Because if you're teaching at a privileged school, your kids' test scores are going to be fine, no matter what kind of teacher you are. That's what test scores do. But in any case, that's a, a long way around saying, I love you. Okay. She had her hand up forever. Okay. No. Person in blue? Well, uh, sorry, we have okay. oh, you have somebody here first. Okay. okay. Uh, she's the then, then, wait, one minute for blue. You know, Bill, I really appreciated your comment when you started about... Um, you know, freedom of speech. And, I saw you uh, nodding. Yes. I appreciate that too. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I'm, I stand here proudly as the daughter of a World War II veteran, the sister of a Marine who served in Vietnam, and the mother of a son who served four deployments in this war on terror. I really do appreciate your comments, and it is because of those brave soldiers that you really terrorized in the 60s and 70s that you have the right uh, to stand up here freely. Also, I'd like to thank these police officers here too. Um, they also protect you. They're here today to protect your right to free speech. So God bless them, and I hope you'll agree with me. I'm delighted that I got to make that comment to you yeah, because it. you and I are so diametrically opposed on soldiers, and what great Americans they are, and, and policemen too. I mean, they provide security. I, I do have a question though. Could I, could I say on that and then I'll let you get sure. your question? Sure. You saw that when I came in, I shook the police officer's hands and said thank you. But I also told the college that I didn't feel they needed to beef up any security. I don't feel unsafe. I figured that if I got to the podium, I'd be fine, and I am. And uh, I don't think anybody's gonna do anything stupid. So I, I appreciate what the police do uh, in many of their uh, iterations. And the question of service, you know, I, I think that one of the things I think we need to rethink in our language, among other things, is what service means. So whenever I'm at the airport and they say, uh, we'd like to uh, allow the, serv the people in uniform to get on first and thank you for your service, I always say, and let's let the nurses and teachers get on first and thank them for their service too. Let the businessmen get on last. So I, it's not that I'm against, the, you know, uh, military service, but I think the idea that service means only military service and leaves you guys out is ridiculous. We are, you guys are committing a service. Onward to your uh, question. Thank you. Onward to my question, and, and I'll quote you, you know, guilty is, guilty is, I think it was, what was the quote? It was, uh, the, the quote was a quip, and you can find it in my book, Fugitive Days, and it says, guilty as hell, free as a bird, and it's a quote from, um, uh, uh, Steve McQueen in the movie HUD. But you forgot the last part. Which Guilty is really free as a bird, said. it's a great country. That's America is a great country, I believe. I, I, I know your, your quotes. Um, I guess we're both getting up there in years, Mr. Ayers. But I, I, I have nothing but amnesia. <laughs> I can't remember damn things. Well, I, love to, us, I would love to remind you. <laughs> I really, really <laughs> well, would. No, I would from, look forward to that's that. That's a quote from Steve McQueen. It's a, it's a lovely quote. Well, I have... Here, here's, here's why I came here today. I have an issue, or I thought I did, with the college because I read the bio they published um, on you and I was absolutely, I was horrified because I do believe that we owe uh, the youth and the students in this room the truth about everything, about all about billiards. But then I realized Mr. Julian, who's the communications director, informed me that they only, they publish what you give them. So now my question to you, is, oh, that's not true? No, I didn't give them anything. So whatever they published, I oh. have no idea. Oh, well, yeah. well, here I have a question. Okay. Because I, I have a copy in my hands. I could read the bio on you. But I don't understand why you published a book called Prairie Days, which is basically your Prairie communist Fire. manifesto. Prairie, Fire. Prairie Fires, excuse mm -hmm. me. Thank you for that correction. You also <clears throat> published a book called Days of Rage. No, Which, Fugitive Days. Fugitive Days. Oh, what happened to Days of Rage? That was the name of a demonstration, but the book is called Fugitive Days. Oh. I recommend you all get it. 2001, available on Amazon. Go You're absolutely it. right. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Thank you for correcting me. Days of Rage, you know, basically, I think, didn't it chronicle three days how you terrorized Chicago policemen? The day, the and isn't that what you did? 
Yeah, the Days of Rage demonstration were three days in Chicago in 1969. I'll tell you about it, but go forward. Okay, but here, so here's my question. This gentleman behind asked a very pertinent question. He said, why are you so vilified? Well, Bill, you need to be a little more inclusive on your bio. Mm. Because then people will understand why you're so vilified. I would love to come back and tell these students why I vilify you. Um, <laughs> I really, really would. And I plan to get a table because I was told that if I get permission from the school, I can set up a table and share the information I came here to give them sure. today. But I was told that I had to get permission. Well, you, you know, in my view, in my view, you should hand out any information you like that that. Uh, a lot of the kind of things that keep getting repeated in a kind of an echo chamber are not true. But what is true, and, I, and I'm not shy about it, and I don't deny it, and I don't hide from it, is that I was a militant activist against the Vietnam War, and I'm very proud of that, actually. I'm not at all ashamed of that. Um, and I was a leader of Students for a Democratic Society, and when SDS broke up, I was one of the founders.